that's the fundraising branch. So I don't know if you all know that you can become a member of the museum, but these forms are in the front. So that helps us continue to do these kinds of programs. And then a little housekeeping. We don't have any students with us this evening and we thought we would, but when Paul is done speaking, we're gonna have a question and answer. Last time, last week, we had a little confusion. People started getting up and leaving. So I would just ask if you could please remain through the question and answer time with Paul. And then without further ado, I get to introduce Mr. Paul. He is from Custer and I have to read these because I didn't That's memorize right. them. But it's like a who's who of the greatest places your photographs could possibly be published. Life Magazine, Reader's Digest. Yeah, that's right. Right? Yeah, exactly. We remember. <laughs> USA Today, National Geographic, Smithsonian, and several books. So that's a pretty hefty roster. Impressive. Yeah. And his specialty is taking historic photographs and actually replicating them in modern photography. So I'm excited. He is going to highlight the photo pairs from the Black Hills. And this happens to be the 160th anniversary. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Ooh. Get a little, ooh, get a little, ooh, yeah, you're doing it right. Okay. Of the 1874 expedition of Custer. So without further ado, Paul Horson. Thank you very much. May I use your microphone? Thank you. Thank you so much. Get this in here. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Appreciate it. Uh, I drove over from Custer and beautiful drive across the part of the Black Hills and parts of Wyoming, of course, to get here. And I always enjoy uh, coming this way and I uh, get to go out to Yellowstone once in a while and come by to that. And so love, love coming through here. And thank you again for, for coming out. Uh, um, I, my talk will be, you know, maybe, I hope not an hour. I, it depends on how much I ramble in the middle. But if anybody, <laughs> in spite of the questions afterwards, needs to get going for any reason, don't, you won't hurt my feelings. Um, but uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, I live in Custer, you know, a very historic area like this whole country, but uh, I've done many types of photography. All those publication credits are getting out there a few years ago. I think National Geographic was like 22 years ago now, but, uh, uh, and I got $100 for that picture, so I'm not living on that <laughs> anymore, but uh, <laughs> but it's a thrill to, to be published like that. This is, of course, Black Elk Peak or Harney Peak, as it was formerly known over in the Black Hills. Uh, so I do other kinds of photography historically, you know, along with the history, but love, of course, Mount Rushmore and once in a while they go up there and inspect and get these cool pictures of guys up there. I've always been interested in history, though, and uh, that's what I tried to bring photography and history together in a way. Uh, I didn't invent this technique, but I learned about it over 20 years ago and, and began practicing this idea of re-photography, of setting your camera exactly where someone did many, many years ago, you know, maybe 160 years ago in some cases around parts of the country because it's getting out there long enough to have photos that are that old. And so this has kind of become the basis then of several books that uh, we've published, our little publishing firm uh, based in Custer with my, my partner, Camille Reiner, uh, uh, happens to be a book, uh, a graphic designer and book designer. I married the right gal there and uh, she does an awesome job making our books I think look beautiful and, and we take a lot of pride in that. So so that's uh, five books that we've used this technique in along with a lot of just straightforward history as well. And uh, we can't do it without our readers. So I know I, several of you brought some books along to have them signed and really appreciate that. Uh, my co-authors on the two books that I'll mostly be talking about, about the Custer Expedition, John Nelson on the left there and Ernie Graffy on the right. Uh, a lot of what I'm gonna share with you tonight is their work as well. I just wanna make it clear I didn't do all of this myself. We have a lot of a lot of help from, from these guys and, and various museums and archives and other books that have been published. You know, we're always kind of building on things that have been researched in the past. So, but uh, primarily I'll be speaking about this book, Exploring with Custer, and we just updated this. That's why there's a little number four up in the corner. Last year, June of 2023, a completely revised fourth edition. And this book is focused on the Black Hills section of the expedition's trail. Uh, it follows the route through the Black Hills. We've got journals and diaries and, and a lot of photographs, as we're going to see shortly. Uh, so that's about the Black Hills part of their trip. That took us about three years to put together originally, and then another three years here recently when we did the revision. But So we have another book called Crossing the Plains with Custer, which uh, covers the rest of their trail to and from Fort Abraham Lincoln, and I'll be talking more about that in a minute. But just the idea is together, these are kind of the whole story of this 1874 expedition that was headed for the Black Hills. And uh, what's new in the new edition? 
Um, so the original book, uh, well, it was well over 300. It was 300 and, uh, uh, 300 pages. Now it's 336 pages. We added 36 pages. We did update almost every other page in some way or another, uh, and uh, but uh, primarily added those 36 pages. Also, I went back to all the photo sites. So there's 50 photo sites around the Black Hills where the photographer back in 1874 took pictures. And um, those have all been located now over time. We've been able to find all of them. Uh, and uh, so I, I went back on the same day that he shot those in 2020 and was able to rephotograph all of those locations again. Uh, and uh, also tried to match the time of day if I could. So digital photography allowed me to do that. Back in 2002, when our first edition came out, uh, there was no way on film, uh, I was still using film then, that I could do that idea of shooting the photos on that same exact date. It was just too complicated. So I'm happy about that. And then our state archives in Pierre, South Dakota, in our capital over there, has uh, the original glass plate negatives of this photographer's work. Uh, those were purchased in the 1920s from a collector in St. Paul, Minnesota, and they've been preserved pretty well. A few couple have disappeared or been broken, but most of them are still there. So they're, uh, uh, those have been scanned now and the quality coming off those negatives is just amazing. And so that's been added to this new edition as well. We also colorized a few of them as we'll see. And then we added some new sources. We found another diary. Uh, we got some more information about the Indian scouts and added that in. And then uh, we've updated all the GPS data so as you're using this book, you can just sit there in your armchair and read it, and that's enjoyable, I think. But if you do get out into the Black Hills and want to look up a spot, there's GPS data, and you punch that into your phone. And you know, with caution, don't just, you know what I'm saying, we've heard about <laughs> these people heading up into the desert, you know, without, there's no road there anymore. Uh, but uh, it will get you to those locations, including the photo sites uh, of this photographer when they're on public land, which many, many of them are on public uh, forest service land. <clears throat> And then uh, also along the wagon route, as I said, you can navigate along the, the route of this wagon train. Uh, and you look really carefully that we'll see this photo again later, but you know, you're driving right along there where the wagons went through in some of these places. So, and then there have been some land ownership changes since the original edition was published in 2002. So 20 some years later, uh, we've added that into this new edition as well. Um, what was this expedition all about? In, in 1874, and I, I'm sure most of you know the difference, uh, the Little Bighorn, 1876, Black Hills Expedition, 1874. I do talk to groups from, you know, out east or something, and they kind of blend everything together. So I always mention that. But, you know, one basic reason was that the Black Hills were sort of a blank spot on the map at that time. And there had been uh, <coughs> small military parties around the edges of the hills and uh, fur trappers and that sort of thing, but nobody had really tried to map it. And, uh, so the army was looking for a way to to get the lay of that land, you know, to understand what was what was in the Black Hills. And uh, Private Ewart wrote, you know, that it was kind of a blank spot. So we're going to fill that in if we if we're able to do that. But under that, uh, General Sheridan also talked about in an official report to Congress that he thought the Lakota were coming out of the Black Hills and going down into Nebraska and causing trouble, raiding settlements and you know the wagon trains and so on that were heading farther west. So he wanted to build a fort somewhere on the west side of the Black Hills. So Custer theoretically was looking for the site of a fort to be established. That never really happened. But under the official reasons, we have also this idea of whether gold might be found in the Black Hills. And uh, that was very much being discussed by the public in the newspapers before Custer even left Fort Lincoln, uh, talking about, we hope Custer finds gold. You know, we've been hearing rumors of gold for many years. Maybe we'll get a gold rush like we had back in 1849 and get the economy going because there'd been a there'd been a panic or a depression in 1873. So a lot of hopes for gold discovery. Um, but there was this uh, uh, obstacle, you might call it, or just a legal agreement with the Lakota Sioux. The 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty had promised the Lakota most of Western, what's now Western South Dakota, as well as the Black Hills. And uh, there is some language in there uh, that allows government agents and employees of the government as may be authorized, et cetera, et cetera, to travel over these lands in the official duties. Um, I don't know if this is what they had in mind when they wrote those lines, but Custer's guys did come down here. And so it is a history that we study, but we try to remember this was a, you know, a trespass of probably uh, breaking some of the, the spirit, if not the letter of that treaty. So they uh, are led by Custer, of course, he's in this picture. 
a little blurry because his horse moved, and this is probably about a 10 second exposure. Uh, who came along with him? Uh, a lot of people. There were about 995 men listed on the roster. Uh, one woman named Sarah Campbell, she was a black woman who worked for the sutler on this expedition. She ended up coming back into the Black Hills during the gold rush, is a, a known figure in Deadwood, is buried up at Galena. Her grave is still known up there. So uh, there's a lot more about her in the book, but that's just a, an interesting sidelight there. Uh, there were 70 Indian scouts. Mostly these were Arikara and Re Indians who um, were traditional enemies of the Sioux, the Lakota. And that's where they were going, to the Black Hills, where the Lakota theoretically were holding that, that area. So some of these scouts saw that as an opportunity to kind of go against their old enemy, the, the Sioux. But the, these uh, scouts were essential to Custer as he literally, you know, didn't know how to get to the Black Hills. So they, some of these guys had been to the hills in the, earlier in their lives or even in the last few years or so. So they knew how to guide the wagon train to the Black Hills about roughly 300 miles from Fort Lincoln. Uh, so they were essential to Custer in that regard. There were five newspaper reporters writing down almost everything that happened, kind of almost a play by play, hour by hour as they're traveling through the Black Hills, especially really good material that we use in our book. And then uh, a couple of miners, uh, William McKay and uh, Frank, I'm sorry, um, yeah, William McKay and Horatio Ross, who discovered gold in the Black Hills. I mean, that's a spoiler alert. They did find gold on this expedition, and uh, Ross is. Uh, ended up living in the Black Hills as well in the town of Custer that was founded later. And so he's a well-known local figure and was able to sort of, he lived till 1904. So he kind of uh, <clears throat> colorized his story. You know, he became the local authority, the, the pioneer, the discoverer of gold and was admired and looked upon by a lot of people for that reason and was buried in our cemetery. There's a, a big memorial to him in one of our parks in Custer as well. So that's, uh, that's part of it. He was definitely interested in looking for gold on the expedition, and then they, they did find it near Custer. There's a team of map makers under a guy named Captain Ludlow uh, working with several other people. We'll, we'll talk more about Ludlow and his map in a little bit. Several other scientists that are studying the rocks, the plants, the geology. So this is an official government expedition. They're expected to give a report to Congress at some point afterwards. What did we find? Uh, what are the resources? What are the, the challenges out there? And that's what Ludlow was doing with the information from these other scientists. There was a photographer, of course, and Kevin's for me, uh, William Henry Illingworth. Uh, we see his wagon in some of the pictures. It's a little different than the typical covered wagons, so uh, we can pick that out sometimes. There it is again in the front there. And there are about 110 covered wagons all together, bringing all the supplies they would need for about a two-month expedition. And uh, about 1,500 horses and mules. Uh, roughly 700 mules pulling the wagons, six mules on each wagon, 800 cavalry uh, soldiers riding horses. They had some spares, some horses died and so on. They would replace those. And then uh, they were well armed. They had a cannon and uh, a mountain howitzer, they would sometimes call that, and, a, and three Gatling guns. Um, and uh, so they were very well defended against, obviously they're concerned about attack by the, the Lakota uh, as they went to the Black Hills. Um, but on this expedition, Custer was not in a mind frame to get into conflict with the Lakota. He was not looking for a fight. He went out of his way not to alarm a group of Lakota that they came to a small village up in the Black Hills, and that's all explained in the book. I'm not defending him. Uh, I'm not a big fan of Custer per se. I mean, I'm more interested in the, the photographer and some of the other folks on this expedition, but, but uh, it is a different time for him. He's not just, you know, let's attack this village and wipe everybody out, which is perhaps a little more of his frame of mind elsewhere in his, in his career, certainly at the Little Bighorn. So um, yeah, I just want to mention that. But just to keep things light, uh, they did have a 16-piece brass band. And uh, we're fortunate in this one photo only, we can make out that this guy's got a tuba or a horn on the back of his horse ready for action. And uh, so the band would play when camp was being set up each afternoon or at other times when the um, you know, if they're coming along to a gully and they need to build a bridge or cut some trees down that were in the way, they, they rolled boulders out of the way to make a path for the wagon train. Um, that was a lot of work. It might take an hour or two. The band would play at those times to entertain the, the troops as they were working. So, well, here's where they came from. Uh, this is Fort Abraham Lincoln up on the Missouri River uh, near present day Mandan, North Dakota, uh, then Dakota Territory, of course. And uh, looks like this now from that approximate angle. 
Um, all the buildings were gone at one time, but they've rebuilt some of those, including Custer's home. So it's a state park now, a uh, wonderful place to visit if this, history, this kind of history is of interest to you. Um, well, worth the, well worth the time to go up there sometime. Uh, up there in the corner of this map of present day North and South Dakota, a little bit of Montana and a little chunk of Wyoming there that they traveled to, through as well as they went to the Black Hills. And so they started their journey on July 2nd of 1874. Uh, took them almost three weeks to get to where they were like at the base of the Black Hills, uh, arriving around July 20th, uh, kind of skirting the edge of the western side of Black Hills over into Wyoming there, and then uh, crossing into the hills proper. And they end up uh, at a site where the town of Custer is today. They stayed there for two nights, right where the town is. Um, and then they moved three miles east of Custer, where they stayed for five days. And that was the longest they stayed in any one spot. Every other camp was either one night or sometimes two. Uh, so from that camp, they explored the Black Hills in the Southern Black Hills in particular. And then uh, by August 6th, they're coming up through the Black Hills and kind of on their way back already, but they do go up through the Central Black Hills, down the Nemo Valley. They exit the Black Hills just north of Rapid City near Black Hawk, if you know that country, and uh, end up camping near Bear Butte on the Northeastern corner of the hills for a couple of nights. But then by August 16th, they're on their way back to Fort Lincoln, but still exploring this area up the Northwest there. Uh, they're charting the route of the, uh, the Little Missouri River, the course of the, the Little Missouri River for the mapping purposes. And then eventually they get back to Fort Lincoln on August 30th. So it's about a two month expedition. Only three weeks at that time, they're in the Black Hills. The rest of the time they're coming and going from the Black Hills, uh, but still exploring and a lot of things happen. And that's why we did that uh, second volume to kind of fill that out. So we know all this because of these wonderful maps that uh, Captain Ludlow and his team put together back in 1874. Um, this is the report to Congress. You can still, you know, find these on the collector's market for a few hundred dollars. Uh, if you're lucky, the maps are still in there and you fold those out and scan them into a computer or <clears throat> look at them with a magnifying glass. There are three maps. One's about geology. One shows their whole route and the other one is just kind of focused on the Black Hills portion of uh, their trip. Uh, so these are a primary source for figuring out where they went. Um, surprisingly sophisticated methods used to put these together. They had two odometer carts that just followed the wagon train and could measure mileage each day. So they were able to average the two carts to get the number of miles uh, between two campsites. So that is one basic bit of information they would add to the map. Uh, they also took latitude and longitude readings at most of their campsites, and they were constantly writing down things as they traveled along. We haven't been able to find all the original notes for those descriptions, but from other expeditions like this, we know there were people that just like watched a compass all day. Okay, now we're going southeast for about a half a mile. They're drawing what they call the meander line. And, and oh, oh boy. Okay, that's some water. Um, I guess I better have a drink now. All right. Um, it didn't hit the computer. We're okay. Uh, so my apologies. Uh, but uh, yeah, all this information going then into the map, and uh, you know, which we find to be quite accurate today, despite you know 150 years going by, um, it's quite useful to us even today, uh, thanks to those odometer carts and, and some of the other technology that they had. So you zoom into these maps, <clears throat> the detail is, is quite amazing. Uh, of course, they call it Harney's Peak, or Harney Peak as we used to call it, Black Elk Peak now. Uh, landmarks like that and places like, we know where the town of Custer is, of course, and that they camp there. There are actually photographs of this camp, so we know exactly where that is. And that's what my co-author, Ernie Graffy, 22 years ago now, you know, was starting to kind of put this map into context on topographic maps. And other people had done this in earlier times in a more crude way, but he developed this way with like plastic overlays. And then eventually with computers, we were able to do a lot more with that, uh, which really gave us an advantage, Google Earth and so on, when that came along. But uh, so that's the idea. We were trying to figure out if they've you know, got a map, they got an arrow here showing the route of the wagon train or some dotted lines going both directions. Uh, where is that today? You know, that's what we were trying, the question we were trying to answer. And, and that we feel like we've uh, we've established pretty well for the, the whole wagon route. Additionally, though, also important are written sources like the, the newspapers or these a few diaries that we have from this expedition, which uh, 
have a lot of written information describing the route, but also like sketches of places that they went by, let's say. So we looked at this one. It was sketched by the, the geologist Newton Winchell on July 30th. Uh, and on July 30th, they were coming into where the town of Custer is. That's where they camped on July 30th of 1874. So, you know, um, we went north of Custer along that back trail and, oh, my, my apologies, uh, found that, uh, that rock formation, which is not quite as dramatic as it sounds. It's just north of town. It's along the highway. And once you look, you know, you're looking right at it and realize that uh, that is definitely the same uh, range of mountains. It's the Buckhorn Mountain Range there, just north of Custer. If you drive up to Crazy Horse Memorial from Custer and look out your right window, you can see this pretty easily. Um, I live a mile north of Custer, not because of this, but it's one reason that got me interested when I realized all of this was, you know, a half mile from my door uh, that they'd gone by on their way into the area where the town of Custer is today. So, uh, so that's some of the stuff we tried to put together. But having the photographs, of course, is a huge help because it it proves where certain campsites were, where the wagon train traveled in some cases, and gives us a lot of insight into the, the photographer as well. Um, he was shooting in stereo with a stereo camera that would have looked something like this. We we don't have his actual camera. We don't know what happened to that. He was out of St. Paul, and you know we just don't know what happened to it. But uh, uh, but it would have looked a lot like this. This is an 1870s wet plate camera, wet plate process he was using. Uh, as I said, his exposures were usually about 10 or 15 seconds long, so there's no shutter. You just took the lens caps off and counted, you know, or whatever the timing was to make a picture. So he's using glass negatives. He would start with a clean piece of glass, and while he was at the location where he was about to take a picture, coat it with chemicals right there, go into a little dark tent and make it sensitive to light, put it in a holder, put it into the camera, take off those lens caps, count to 15, put them back, put the lens caps back on, take out the plate, and then develop it in a, in a tray of solution, uh, maybe in a little dark tent or maybe in his wagon if it was nearby. And uh, these negatives were the result, these stereo negatives, one picture on each side of the glass. Uh, again, these are from the State Historical Society. They're about eight inches wide, uh, about four and a half inches tall. Uh, they've got about 75 plates, I think. Um, he took duplicates in addition to shooting in stereo. He'd sometimes take two pictures, probably as insurance in case one of them got broken. But photographers back then would also trade negatives with other photographers sometimes and uh, uh, publish them under their own brand. So uh, that's a little bit of speculation. But so this particular view is of a campsite um, up on the North Dakota border, North and South Dakota border, uh, July 8th of 1874. They were they were camped in that location for one night, a place called Hiddenwood. And uh, this is how Illingworth, the photographer, presented the work when he sold these to the public. Uh, we'll talk about why he was shooting in this format in just a moment. But uh, having the original negative, the full scan, you can kind of see how he cropped you know, his own work to fit it on these cards. So to have the full view was really helpful in terms of trying to figure out the photo sites when I was working on these. Um, and also you see things out at the edge of the negative then, like this is a title that he scratched into the edge with a, a pencil or something. And it does say Hidden Wood Camp. And that's you know his uh, label for this particular picture because that's what it shows. We don't have any diaries or journals from the photographer. So this is the extent of what we know about his writing and what he, what he wrote at the time. Um, so I'm uh, trying to match up this photo. Of course, it's on a private ranch. I had permission from the landowner. And I was shooting about the same time of day, and I was watching my uh, my shadow was sort of creeping into the picture, and I thought I'm going to have to adjust the tripod or something. And and then I get to studying the uh, original photo and uh, realized I guess I was I was getting closer than I, than I thought. Um, I really didn't notice that. I mean, it was kind of in the corner, you know. It's just a, uh, anyway, that that worked out well. Um, a very surprising uh, outcome there, but. Uh, so this is from our book, Crossing the Plains with Custer, but it kind of shows um, you know, what I'm trying to do. We'll look at some more of those. And then again, these scans of these original negatives. Now, I don't have a picture of what we had available for this print back in 2002, but trust me, it was a lot blurrier than this. It's like a surveillance photo from space. You know, uh, you can kind of pan around in the, in the camp and see different things. And for example, they talk about shooting hundreds of antelope out on the prairie. I mean, they were everywhere. You know, you see them today, and that's what they were eating for dinner every night. 
uh, and they shot deer and elk once they got up in the Black Hills. Uh, they shot everything they saw, you know, but uh, they were eating a lot of it. And so I think what we're seeing here is that this guy, I think, is dressing out an antelope. You can just see the legs there. It's just a little blurry. Obviously, they're making a campfire. They've got brush they've gathered for fire. They're drying out stuff on the tent. You know, they got the wagon cover back. It's just a, a like a slice of life uh, of, of, a, of the camp. And so it's an awesome picture. Um, and, uh, you know, each one of these has that capability to be examined. So um, Illingworth was shooting in this stereo format for this very reason. And I'm almost positive there's one of these on display uh, around the corner here. But you see a stereo image when you look at these. And uh, if that doesn't ring a bell, this will. I know I saw one of these over in the toy display there. Um, it's still fun today. You know, people will look in there and go, wow, you know, the grizzly bear or whatever. And uh, so uh, that's the format that a lot of photographers around the world at this time were shooting in and selling to their customers or their clients or through bookshops and that sort of thing, uh, because that's how people learned about the world along with reading books. There wasn't a lot of other options, of course, back then like radio and TV. So here's the photographer, William Henry Lingworth. I met one of his descendants up in St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, back in the early 2000s. Uh, Mr. Burlingame, he's passed away now, but uh, uh, he and I uh, collaborated to uh, get this uh, marker placed on Illingworth's grave up in the Oakland Cemetery in St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, so we had it inscribed with uh, information about the Custer Expedition of 1874. And then Illingworth was also on the Fisk Expedition in Montana, 1866. I uh, worked with another guy taking pictures then. So that may be what got his credentials going, maybe for the, the Custer expedition. But uh, uh, that was an expedition going out to the gold, the Montana gold fields. So similar, similar thing. Uh, well, just a few shots here then, finally looking at some photos that he took. And this one is uh, in Wyoming, the Wyoming side of the Black Hills, a place called Indian Cara. Can I just poll? You all recognize that name over here? Yeah, here yeah pretty here. much. Okay. Um, you know, it's between... Uh, uh, Newcastle and Sundance, if you drive from one to the other, you almost have to go by, and you'll see that out there. And uh, on July 23rd of 1874, they were camped nearby Custer and, a, uh, I believe, a, a company of cavalry and some of the newspaper reporters and so on climbed to the top, hoping to see uh, a route into the Black Hills. You know, they were hoping to find a trail, sort of. Uh, it was very smoky, so they weren't able to do that. Um, but... Uh, and uh, yeah, there were a lot of fires burning during the time of this expedition. Um, there's so many rabbit holes and digressions, but this one's fascinating to me, and I'll just stop for a second. The reason it's smoky is because we think on their way down, they were camping up by the Cave Hills, which is up in northwestern South Dakota. When they came back through that area after being in the Black Hills, somebody wrote, we noticed that the campfires from our earlier camp had escaped. You know, they, they hadn't put them out. And the prairie was burned for like 100 miles from that point on. I mean, they lost livestock because they couldn't find enough grass as they were traveling along. So so uh, I speculate the smoke here was caused by that fire, although the wind direction might not have been right. But there could have been other fires in Yellowstone or anywhere that would have caused, of course, these smoky conditions. But it's interesting to, to speculate about that. So they're up there on Indian Cara. Meanwhile, the photographer uh, is uh, taking a couple of pictures of that mountain as a landmark as he's recording the, the country there. We don't have any photos of Illingworth at work, but we do have this, this shot of his shadow at work, uh, you know, and again, the shadow of his tripod. Uh, and uh, July 23rd, uh, a few years later, uh, 2020, there it was. Uh, and uh, this is on a, a ranch, private ranch as well, that got permission and uh, actually went out there and set up my camera the day before just to make, you know, make sure I'd be absolutely ready on the right day at the right time. It's about 7.30 in the morning, you know, I think is when I recorded, but uh, so, uh, and then uh, you can see the changes, you know, there are more trees in a lot of these pictures, um, not in all of them, I'll try to mention that again later, but, uh, and then the arrow is just kind of pointing at a detail in the photo, um, you, know, you kind of look at that and go, I wonder what the heck that is, and when you're out at the photo site, you can actually uh, see that uh, tree sitting there, it's a tree stump that's tipped over, and so you're looking at the bottom of the tree and the roots are kind of sticking up in the air like that. Uh, so it's really amazing. And we've got uh, some information on that here in this next uh, photo site. Um, so this picture uh, is called Wagon Train in the Castle Creek Valley. Uh, Castle Creek is up in the Black Hills on the South Dakota side of the line. They've gone through Floral Valley already at this point, which is over in Wyoming, but then they crossed the, this today the border. And uh, um, so there's the wagon train, you know, coming down the valley there. 
uh, heading towards the camera. It's coming this direction. And they got stalled here around the corner from, you can't see it, but there was a large beaver dam across the width of the valley. And so it was very muddy and, you know, very difficult for wagons. So they were stopped there for about four hours, according to some of the, the sources that are in our book. So you can imagine the photographer, uh, you know, there's his wagon right there in the middle. He parks and gets on a horse or mule or whatever and uh, rides up. You know, we can see this cliff up there. Maybe I can maybe I can get a picture there and uh, takes this photo and another one almost exactly like it. Um, and uh, also interesting in the corner of this picture, he caught this object, which I've learned from talking to people who still do this type of work, is a, uh, a small portable dark room that he would have processed those glass plates in with a black cloth laying on top of it. So um, just kind of neat to get a little glimpse of his, uh, his technology there. And then, uh, so uh, this light looks like this today. This was July 26th of 1874 and July 26th of uh, 2020. 2020. Uh, and uh, I was trying to get the time of day and everything. It, you know, I lucked out with the clouds over the sun kind of softening the light and so on and looked like a, a pretty good match and uh, surprisingly unchanged. There are these tree stumps there as well, these burnt stumps. It's the same one. It's leaning a little more now. And there are others. I mean, there's... Uh, one here that's there. And there's actually one right here behind it that you can just barely see here. But uh, oh, I'm sorry, up here. Uh, and there are others. If you if you turn around from the camera point uh, and uh, and look around in the woods, there are other stumps that look just like these that are in the foreground. And so, you know, we got to thinking and I was talking to the, it's actually the, the chief forester for the Black Hills National Forest, Blaine Cook. Uh, he's retired now a couple of years ago, though. Uh, he was interested in this. Uh, and we agreed that these are probably the same approximate age of the ones that are over here in the camera view. And so he cut one of those down and sent it to a lab in Colorado where they study tree rings, dendrochronology it's called. And uh, they were able to date that by comparing it to other tr known trees. And what they found out was this similar one sprouted in 1418. The outer ring dates to 1570. Uh, they think it might have died in a 1685 fire, and if that's true, it's been standing there for 340 years, so that stump or, or, or snag. So uh, regardless, they know that tree is 605 years old, the one that's behind the camera, and we can, again, assume these are at least a similar age, maybe older, maybe a little younger. But So it's kind of neat to have that background information on that. Um, well, back in 2002, when our first book came out, kind of the conventional wisdom, the consensus uh, was that the forest had overgrown, you know, fires had been put out for over a hundred years, right? Because we wanted to save the timber and save the towns that are all over the Black Hills from, from fire. And uh, that had resulted in a very dense forest. And that's certainly what I was seeing. That's what people back in the 1970s were seeing who were studying these pictures in an earlier book. Um, and so uh, that's, you know, that was the state of affairs. They weren't probably logging fast enough, really, uh, and didn't have any natural fire from lightning, which used to cleanse the forest, you know, uh, get all the dead branches and so on and burn that in a natural way before white settlement, right? And so uh, you can kind of see that in this photo. I'm trying to replicate the one on the left back in 2002. And really, I'm just getting little windows like that sometimes where I can kind of, yeah, that looks pretty good. And I would take a picture and we put it in the book. And I you know, kind of thought that was the best I could do. I guess it was. Uh, but by 2020, we'd had about 15 years of a mountain pine beetle epidemic over there, which killed literally millions of trees. And then many of them after they died were, were logged, salvage logging. So um, what you have then, I realized that other picture I had taken from way down here, I realized I needed to back up. And I kept backing up and I finally came to this rock and I can see that's the same rock formation. Uh, and uh, but here's a tree that had been logged out uh, after being killed by the mountain pine beetle. These are trees that for whatever reason they didn't cut, maybe they were too far gone. They had to cut them within a year or the wood wasn't any good uh, for the logging companies, but uh, the sawmills. So, um, but you can kind of see now with the mountain pine beetle in this example, how the forest has sort of gone back to where it was. We do have in 1874, now that's a real general statement and it's not like it's this way everywhere. It's not that way everywhere, but it, you are seeing that a little bit. Generally, the trees are smaller now uh, than they were back then. I mean, these are massive uh, trees here, but uh, but there are more of them because they're they're not as far apart. Um, another good example here 
Um, this is after the mountain pine beetle. Again, dead trees from that, a few survivors. And then the young trees are growing really, really fast. Uh, you know, they'll be 10, 15 feet tall in a few years. They're very close together. So the fire danger is again, I think, increasing. And there's a lot of debate. You've probably been catching some of this. Neiman Sawmill is closing, you know, mills and uh, reducing their workforce. And that's a serious issue. Um, but they're just, to my, in my opinion, there are not as many saw logs as there were 20 years ago. I, I don't know how else to explain it, but that's just kind of my observation from, from looking at these photos. But, well, we'll move on to history again. Uh, Illingworth was trying to record a picture of Harney Peak at 10 miles. That's what he titled this, uh, Black Elk Peak, as we call it now. And uh, this is very, very close to where he was. I, I'm able to triangulate by looking at a picture on my computer and comparing it to his, and it'll just shift like this if I need to move over. Then it'll do this, and then I move over, and it's just like right there. And I'm sorry, even with far away landmarks like this. So I think I'm within about 20 feet of his site here at the most. Um, but uh, that's uh, looking at the um, Harney Peak or Black Elk Peak Range as they were moving towards where they were going to camp that night on the town site of Custer. Uh, so on July, that was July 30th. On July 31st, they're already camped here, July 30, 31, as Ludlow put on the map. On July 31st, it was their second day of camp there, Ludlow and Custer and a detachment of soldiers and some newspaper reporters and Winchell, the geologist, decide to climb Black Elk Peak or Harney Peak. And they take this route that's shown on the map. Uh, they rode horses that didn't take any wagons. That would have been too much even for Custer. But uh, they get up to Black Elk Peak or close to it, but they have some trouble. Um, they literally say, we're at the top. You know, they're writing this down. Uh, and then they go, wait a minute, there's a little taller hill that way. And so that's number two. They were on number one, they saw number two. They, another couple of hours, they get to the top of number two, and they go, oh my God, there's our peak, you know, off in the distance there. Uh, and so it was really late in the day when they finally got near the summit of um, Harney or Black Elk. Uh, they didn't get to the very summit, but they were looking right at it uh, from below. But it was getting late in the day. They knew they needed to get back before you know, it got too late, they weren't successful, it got dark on them. Uh, it took them hours and hours to get back. And so about one o'clock in the morning on August 1st, they arrived back in camp and huge bonfire has been built to help guide them back. And, you know, people were concerned about them. All these people were missing for a few hours there. So, but uh, earlier in the day on July 31st, there was an interesting event that took place and we know it happened on the town site of Custer. Custer wrote to his uh, wife uh, at some point on this expedition that there's not been a single card party nor a drunken officer since we left Fort Lincoln. And uh, that's a stretcher, you gotta say, because there's a lot of uh, discussion about alcohol in some of the other accounts. And then we have this picture, um, which uh, kind of disproves everything he was writing to, uh, to Libby. But, and uh, they're not playing cards, I'll give them credit for that. Uh, they are, uh, of course, though, having a champagne supper, uh, which was recorded by a couple of diarists, uh, including this account here, where he says the whole party were pretty well hobbled. Uh, so these are you know, some of the primary officers of the expedition. Uh, the guy on the right is Fred Grant, who was the son of President Grant at the time. So he's you know, got his own authority, you might say, and uh, is obviously you know, in charge of this party almost. Uh, uh, we did colorize this picture, obviously, for this book. The State Historical Society, they're super nice, but he did, the archivist said, you know, we want people to know we didn't colorize it because it is a, a point of discussion among historians about whether you should colorize or not. And, you know, I recognize that. I just think the way it brings out details like brass buttons and, and hat colors and things and so on uh, is really hard to resist. And we did try to be historically accurate when we could find something that looked like what was in the picture. But uh, in any case, uh, the drinking party photo, as we call this, usually generically, or the champagne supper, uh, we, I found a spot back in 2002 that I sort of projected for it, and I was looking the right direction, but again, I hadn't quite gotten to the spot, and I didn't have Google Earth back then, as I say, so around, uh, you know, I don't know, 2018, 2019, I'm starting to look at this again, wondering if I could do better, and with Google Earth, I was marking all these spots around Custer where I could see rocks, you know, that kind of looked like what was in the picture and uh, that I wouldn't have gone to otherwise. I didn't know they were there behind trees and so on. And mark, marking these with GPS and eventually, uh, you know, walking around town and 
just looking to see if there's any chance could this possibly still survive in the modern world. And uh, I, you know, I'm still not 100% convinced. Um, the rock formations here are a little different, but um, there's pine needles coming down. I mean, you can see them piled up there that might change that profile. This is the Mickelson Trail, biking trail now, which was the rail line, the railroad through the Black Hills from Custer. And a lot of damage might have been done by construction uh, 125 years ago uh, from that. But there's a couple other things. There's this tree uh, on the left here, and I, you know, just realized, well, there's this stump there. You know, it's, you know, it's almost in exactly, I mean, it is in the spot where it needs to be. Whether that's the same tree or not, I don't know. But this is what we're throwing out in the new book as a as an update to one of the photo sites that I think uh, has a good uh, chance of uh, being the place. Um, this is on public uh, game fish and parks land, our South Dakota Department of Game Fish and Parks. Um, I worked with an archaeologist who's you know licensed federally and so on uh, to maybe do a dig there if she could get a permit, and they didn't want her, they didn't allow her to dig. So we're we're still working on that. Maybe it'll happen sometime, but uh, that would be an interesting place to. Uh, to look for uh, traces of this champagne supper. So, uh, yeah, that that's uh, that was one of our major finds for the updated edition. Uh, if that's the place, well, this is going to go a little faster, but just kind of showing you the lay of the land. That's the same dead tree in both pictures. There, same live tree here. Um, this is looking out over the camp. Now they've moved three miles east of Custer, their permanent camp, as they called it, for five days, August one through the fifth. There's French Creek, that's where gold was discovered, right in this area. Uh, you can still see French Creek today along with some roads that have been put in uh, and uh, looking into Custer State Park there. So that, that shot that I just flipped from is a little hard to get to, it's way up on a mountain there, but this is right at ground level on Forest Service land, easy to visit. Uh, these same boulders here kind of help define that location. Uh, again, you're looking at the campsite in the distance, horses grazing here, smoke from the campfires, and all the tents from you know a thousand people uh, staying in this area uh, for five days back in 1874. The trees have kind of crept down into the meadows here for sure. So there are more trees in some places, uh, fewer trees in other places. But uh, so this the last picture was taken from about right here. Uh, now Illingworth moved across the valley and is looking down from a high rock formation towards Black Elk or Herning Peak in the distance there. Uh, Calamity Peak on the left, that's three miles east of the town of Custer, again, uh, along Highway 16A today, which cuts right through the campsite. And there's a historic marker there you can stop and look at. And uh, I have just a, a brief commercial here, you might say. Um, I'm a member of the local historical society. Surprise, surprise. And, our, and we have a nice museum over there. And uh, it's the 150th anniversary of the Black Hills Expedition this summer. And uh, they were... They chose, unfortunately, August 1 through 5 to be in our area, and that coincides with the motorcycle rally. So I don't know what Custer was thinking, but uh, we can't have it during the motorcycle rally. So a week or so early, we're going to have this uh, uh, anniversary event of the 150th uh, or commemoration of the, of the Custer expedition on Sunday, July 21st, from about 10 to 5. Um, in the morning, we're going to have some speakers, probably I might be one of them, at the local high school talking about history. Uh, we've got the new CEO for Crazy Horse Memorial is going to speak with me for Encounter uh, and Dr. David Wolf from Black Hill State University, the history of the gold rush. Uh, that'll be in the morning at the high school. And then we're going to move out to the camp, literally to this spot right here, uh, where the landowner has kindly given us permission to you know, set up a few booths and uh, We'll have uh, reenactors and a wet clay photographer and a blacksmith. And, you know, we're working on this, but it's going to be fun, I think. And it's a free event, uh, free for all, uh, but uh, we are taking donations and also uh, asking for sponsorships from advertisers or businesses or individuals who want to contribute to the uh, 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 some of the travel expenses for some of the exhibits we're bringing in and so on. But uh, the top level... Um, prize, if you can call it that, for donors is a personal tour by me, uh, four to six hours of all of these sites around Custer area. Um, that's $2,500, but you can bring eight people, and uh, I'm not taking any money out of that. It's called the one to the museum or the Black Hills State uh, Scholarship Fund for the Case Library. So I don't do that commercially. I don't do tours. I just haven't gotten into that. So it's a rare opportunity for that. But we do have a website there in the, in the uh, QR code if anybody's interested or 
I can give you more information on that if you'd like. So appreciate you coming over and have a good time in, in July. Oh, I should have said that's part of Gold Discovery Days in Custer, which is our summer event we have every year in Custer, uh, July 20th and 21st this year. Again, the 21st only for the date of the uh, celebration we're having. So uh, moving on to another photo site here and a real fascinating one, uh, this uh, view of the grizzly bear that Custer uh, took credit for shooting uh, back in 1874. He wasn't the only one that shot at it, of course. Uh, everybody in the picture did. We have a uh, bloody knife. Bloody knife is a, a Arikara, uh, half breed, they called him, you know, half Sioux, half Arikara, uh Indian scout, Custer's chief Indian scout, a widely respected scout, and died at the Little Big Horn a couple of years later, fighting alongside Custer. Uh, there were roughly 200 people on this expedition who ended up at the Little Big Horn, losing their lives there a couple of years later. And then Custer, of course, in the middle, and uh, Private Noonan is his orderly, the guy in the back there, and Captain Ludlow, the map maker, and all of them shot at the bear as it jumped up out of the brush. Uh, they were at the head of the wagon train, and here comes this grizzly bear. So they start shooting. We've got uh, probably six or eight, I don't know, pages in the book about this event. There's a lot of information. Everybody wrote about it because it was such a, a big deal to everybody back then. And of course, to Custer, who wrote to his wife about it uh, as well. Um, we did choose to colorize this photo. We also have an uncolorized version in the book. But again, it uh, brings to, to life, uh, you know, there's a dog laying here. That's probably one of Custer's hounds. He had several dogs and other details of the picture, like the buttons and the trim on the, on the uniforms and so on. Um, this photo site is on private land. And um, we knew about this one already from our earlier research back in 2002 with the help of a local a uh, guy, we uh, were able to establish the site of this photo, which had previously been marked with a historic marker about two miles away. But Bernie Graffy, my co-author, looking at the historic map, he comes to me one day and he goes, hey, this campsite looks like it's two miles from you know. And so we got to looking at it and just found the rocks after a buddy. It took about a year altogether. But uh, so that was one of our big uh, discoveries in the earlier edition of the book. Well, they uh, finally get out of the Black Hills. They're camped near uh, Bear Butte uh, on the northeast uh, corner of the hills there. And uh, Illingworth took a photo there. The camp was behind him a couple miles, but a number of people climbed Bear Butte as well. We just don't, we didn't get any, nobody got any pictures of that back then, but we do have this nice photo. And again, with fire suppression out on the prairie, prairie fire, common thing, uh, you see the trees growing up along Bear Butte Creek there as well. Uh, well, uh, just a few pages from the book itself. If you've got the original edition, and I know some of you do, it's a perfectly fine book, the original edition. 90% uh, of it probably is still accurate and, and uh, up to date, but there is a little bit of updates, as you'll see in the, in the new edition, the colorized photos. Uh, we did invite a Lakota scholar, Jace DeCorey, uh, head of the Black Hills State University Indian Studies Program. Uh, she had retired, but uh, she very kindly agreed to write a piece what the Lakota thought about the expedition and what the Black Hills mean to them today. So we added that in, a, in about a three-page essay that she wrote. She wrote this in August of last uh, of 2022. Uh, she passed away in November of 2022. Of course, we went ahead and, you know, with her permission, uh, had printed it as she wrote it. Uh, we found some wagon ruts, and these are right along the track of the uh, map that Ludlow uh, directs us to today. So we do believe these originated with the expedition, even if they might have been used by many other travelers later. So that's called out. Um, again, using the book itself, some of you that haven't seen it, it does guide you, you know, almost mile by mile, tells you where private land is or public land that you can wander on freely or the private land where you need to have permission. Um, as some of you may know, there are some grave sites, two graves uh, near Indian Cara where they camped uh, when you drive from Newcastle to Sundance you go by these uh, off in the distance. That's on private land. They're uh, a little more careful about access. I would encourage you, please, to get permission. Uh, they have had a lot of trouble, unfortunately, with UTVs just, you know, driving up there. And uh, people should know better, but they don't. So, um, but you can read about it. We did get permission to take photos. A lot of information about the grave sites uh, uh, there on the western side of the Black Hills on the Wyoming part of this expedition trail. That's new material in the book. Uh, these are all new photos. and of historic sites and uh, another grave in the Black Hills and uh, some carvings and so on uh, that you can read about. And then we went out and I really wanted to get every museum uh, that was in the Black Hills proper that has an exhibit about the expedition has a photo in the book now as well. 
including the one over in Sundance, uh, Rocky there, we were just talking about him before the talk here, and uh, Custer and uh, Spearfish and Rapid City, you know, they all have fine museums that have nice exhibits about this. So, um, so that's, uh, that's what's new. Um, and uh, just a couple pages from Crossing the Plains will kind of show you what that's about. There aren't as many historic photos taken out on the prairie by Ellingworth. He was saving his glass for the Black Hills, right? So instead I shot photos where the map showed us that they would have gone by right here. And it's very clear they weren't over here and they weren't here, they were going down this valley. Uh, and so I tried to shoot photos where you would have seen them going by, what the landscape looked like uh, across Northwestern South Dakota and over into uh, North Dakota, as well as parts of Wyoming and, and uh, Montana. Uh, this is a view from the top of uh, Bear Butte uh, there on the northeast corner of the Black Hills. Uh, they went around the east side, they crossed two creeks is what this says. So you can see those creeks, you would have seen the wagon train uh, passing by there. And then we have a number of artifacts uh, in the book as well. Uh, these were, I found a few of these. Other people have been collecting for years from some of the campsites on private land between the Black Hills and uh, Fort Lincoln. I emphasize these all came from private property with the permission of the landowners. But those folks that had these in various shoe boxes and so on, let me photograph them so we could include them in the book and do a little interpretation about what kind of stuff were they carrying? What did they lose? What did they throw away? Uh, for example, these are straps from wooden boxes that held the boxes together with square nails going through them. They would burn the boxes because they didn't have any firewood out on the prairie. And so then the, the strapping and the square nails are left behind. And then they simply lost stuff like this uh, that's laying there in the grass for 150 years. So, so that's a neat part of that book. I do have a couple of other books here and just in the few minute, couple minutes left here, um, I will uh, brief you on those. The Black Hills yesterday and today is the same idea with then and now photos that I've been talking about, just using pictures that were taken after uh, Custer's expedition during the gold rush as the railroads came in, uh, early tourism photos, you know, places that people still like to visit today, Mount Rushmore being carved, reservoirs being formed, hotels that burned down, cities that grew, that sort of thing all around the Black Hills. So this does have a few pictures from the Custer expedition in it, just to make things confusing, but it's not about the expedition. I just want to include the earliest photos that I could in that particular book. And then uh, I met a guy named Bob Berry over in Cody, Wyoming, in case any of you know him. Uh, he had been collecting images of Yellowstone for 25 years or longer, stereo views in particular, and also knows the park really well. So he was able to point to where these were on a map or even take me there. And, uh, you know, same trees here, you know, some of the same ideas that I was running into in the Black Hills. These are over 110 years apart, uh, these two photos. And actually, uh, I think both of these are actually fallen over now since I shot that photo but up at Mammoth Hot Springs. In a lot of places that haven't changed at all out there, it's really awesome to see preservation. You know, that park was established in 1871, uh, really does work. So um, this, this uh, place at a place called Trout Lake uh, really looks very much like it did back in 1871. So that's neat to see. Um, I have a little fun with it too. I stand in for the, the photographer if there's the opportunity arises. Uh, this is a wild geyser called Lone Star Geyser. You know, you can just walk right up to it if you're that uh, uninformed, but uh, you know, I was perfectly safe where I was. The wind's blowing the other way and the water isn't that hot by the time it comes down again, but uh, really neat to be that close. So that's Yellowstone yesterday and today. And then lastly, uh, uh, in 2017, we issued this book called Treasures of the National Parks yesterday and today. And we spent about five years, my family and I have a daughter who's uh, just graduating college now, but uh, uh, we went to 24 of the oldest national parks, including Yellowstone and many others across the country. Uh, these are just a glimpse here, but Zion and uh, Bryce Canyon and uh, Arches National Park, of course, and uh, the parks that were established by, say, about 1935. Uh, and I try to get to the actual spot, no matter where it might be located, uh, in the backcountry or or uh, along the, the main park road. But uh, some of these are places that are pretty far back. This is Yosemite out in California. Um, Crazy tourists back then, just like now. It's not just today that they pet the buffalo and do stuff. It's, it was back then too, but uh, uh, in the bottom of the Grand Canyon, Indian Gardens, and really against, these are the same rock formations uh, 
peeking out there that I can see these cracks here. Uh, surprised by the tree growth there as well. I mean, again, lack of fire or anybody cutting them down for uh, campfires. So uh, yeah, when the tourist, uh, and then these are guys exploring the Grand Canyon in 1871 on the Powell expedition, the first time they've gone, or the second time they've gone down the, the river, but they brought a, a photographer this time and they're, they're fixing their boat because it just ran over some rocks. Uh, and uh, yeah, and the one in the, the rock in the foreground is still there. I mean, that just, that's the kind of thing I'm, I'm going for. Um, but, uh, the growth of trees there. So uh, yeah, treasures in the national park. Um, I am on Facebook. Uh, I do use a personal page. You can just follow it if you want to uh, keep up with what I'm doing. I'm working on a South Dakota book now in the next year or so, but uh, uh, but uh, that's uh, that's where we're at. And my website is just my name. Uh, all of our books are available there. Um, I do have some books with me tonight here. I've got the price in here. Um, most of them are hardcover. They're all full color, so the you know, prices are up there a little bit, I realize, for some people. But I do want to encourage you. They have uh, Exploring with Custer, the edition I've been talking about, in the museum store here. So if you want to just go get one there and bring it in, I'll be glad to sign it. I have some here as well, whatever you prefer, but I'd love to, to see the museum sell a few of those. I did bring a hardcover edition of that, and that's $99 because they're individually signed and numbered one through a thousand, and we're not going to print any more. I think we're up in the 300s or the 400s, you know. Eventually, when those are gone, it'll just be the soft cover. And then uh, one other detail here, the hardcover of Crossing the Plains, that's all I brought with me. The hardcover, which is usually 75, I'm going to sell that for 45 tonight, so it's $30 off because I don't have any soft covers along. And then the other two books are both in hardcover as well. So any questions about that, just come up and ask. Um, yeah. And then uh, one final archival photo here from the Paul Horstead collection. Uh, <laughs> back when I uh, still had some hair, uh, I started in high school taking pictures. And uh, this is the, uh, the place where it has led me. So I appreciate your attention tonight. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, I'll be glad to take any questions when we're done here. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so, are there any questions from the audience? And we may possibly get some. They're streaming this also, and we'll see if any anybody comes up with a question. But anybody in the audience yes. here? Yeah. In the beginning, you mentioned there was 990 some right. people on the expedition. Yes. Uh, any of those people, civilians, uh, you know, Kingsters? Uh, yes. Yes, absolutely. We're fortunate that a roster that was in the National Archives around 1970 was very accurately reproduced, uh, transcribed, and published in a, in a book that's out of print now called Ewart's Diary. Um, and so they, they put every name in there and listed what they were, Teamsters, Indian Scouts, the Sutler. And uh, the original has disappeared. We've been to the National Archives. I went to the National Archives, discussed this with the archivist. It's like the box is there, the folder is there, the roster is gone. So they've had things, you know, disappear from the National Archive. Not anymore. They got a, a guy with a gun on his hip now. But uh, you know, I mean, they're real serious. But so unfortunately, that's gone. But it survives. And to answer your question, then that roster describes exactly what the roles of all these people are. I think there were nearly a hundred uh, Teamsters who were civilians. We actually have a diary from a civilian Teamster now. Where, where could I look at that book? Uh, which book? The, the one with the, got the yeah. The roster. I will say we also. I thought just as a historical, we need to preserve this information. It is in the book Crossing the Plains with Custer. Uh, every word that was published on that roster in that earlier book is in Crossing the Plains with Custer. So if you get that book, it is in there. Or you can buy this book called uh, Private Ewart's. Just Google Private Ewart E W E R T uh, 1874 Expedition, and you'll you know you might find a copy in a used book. Uh, uh, store that sort of thing, but uh, once in a while, I have somebody send me an email and they'll say, you know, my great grandfather. We've always heard he was with Custer, and you know, they'll send me the name, and I can look it up on the roster very easily. And I've been able to confirm that a couple of times, and other times, it, it's possible there were people on the expedition who didn't get recorded on the roster, or it's possible that Grandpa was telling a story, or somebody <laughs> thought he was with Custer. You know, both of those things are, are possible. But I'd be glad to help with that in any way I can. And if you ever come up with a name or an ancestor, we'd love to hear about that as well. We're always looking for somebody's got more information. We don't pretend to know it all. There's so much to gather. Uh, additional diaries uh, we think are out there. That's, that's, that's yeah. the reason I asked. Okay. 
Yeah, let me know if I can help anyway. Take my card or whatever. Yeah. Yes, sir. There were a number of tombstones. How, what was the comment? Of yeah. About that? He's asking about the number of tombstones. I showed a couple of pictures of tombstones, so or gravestones. So two men died. Uh, uh, well, I'm sorry. Let me back up. Four deaths on this expedition. Three people died of some kind of stomach or gastric ailment, and they had terrible conditions of drinking water out on the plains. Uh, you know, again, I, I can only present so much information, but there's there's one account that says we were drinking the same water that the mules and horses had been walking through. You know, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of mules and horses, but that's all the water they had. So they got sick, and if they had a weak constitution to begin with, you know, so three guys died, and then a fourth was killed in a very brief gunfight with another soldier. Probably the first person ever killed with a 45 Colt, uh, the, the old classic uh, Western revolver, which was issued for the first time on this expedition. There was one other gravesite, and that was Horatio Ross, uh, who's buried near his custom. So, so surprisingly, yeah, only four deaths out of all of those people that were along. But a lot of people got really sick. Not the officers. They had beer and alcohol. I mean, seriously, to drink and kegs of water in their own personal wagon. So the officers had a need. They could afford those things from the settler. Yeah, any other questions? I was wondering yeah. if the guy on that mule yeah. that had the two-wheel car. Yes. From the looks of his hat, he might have had some runaways. <laughs> Meaning, what does that mean? I'm sorry? <laughs> or his hat all turned up and front. Oh, yeah. I thought maybe some of that wasn't kind of legally dictated, you know. A military uh, uniform type of thing. Yeah. yeah, there was definitely, he was asking about a gentleman riding the mule on the odometer cart, and I and I maybe should have said that wasn't a photo from this expedition, um, but it's exactly the same technology they were using. I mean, uh, but, uh, uh, and, I, and I failed to mention, we can see the odometer cart in one of those overview photos I showed you, but um, so yeah, he was asking also about the hat that the guy was wearing not being standard we do see a lot of variation in uniforms, even in the officers. They're not all necessarily wearing strictly stock uh, uniforms. And certainly the, uh, uh, the Indian scouts, as you may have seen in the one picture, used a lot of creativity in what they were wearing. So, yeah. Any other questions on that? Yes, sir. Yeah, I just wonder, I've read that they were looking for gold and they were trying to pay down the debt from the Civil War. Yeah. So how would the government get money? Would that be from economic development? Right. Or are they going to mine directly? Yeah, he's asking about the you know, the idea that the gold strike would be able to uh, somehow get the economy going again, and how would the government benefit from that? Um, that might be beyond my, my pay grade a little bit. But uh, <laughs> you know, I think the idea is it's just economic activity and development that might come from a huge strike like it did after 1849 out in you know in the in california or probably in montana even in 1866 uh, everybody knew that was that was good and that the railroads would build to get there and you know there would just be a lot of activity um i don't know about paying off the civil war debt but i assume taxes would have been rising as well as uh, salaries so to speak and maybe that would have helped so yeah that's an interesting that sounds like a, a good research paper topic seriously that somebody ought to and probably has somebody probably has done that yeah uh homestake of course that paid off over time so uh they, they made the i mean for better or worse uh, that was the right the right thing to do to acquire that that property black hills in general yeah any other questions very good well again my thanks for you all coming out tonight oh i'm sorry we got one hand up here please go ahead sir He said that was a wonderful joke that I only heard a few hundred, a few times before, and uh, about Custer at the little big horn and. Good news, bad news, bad news, we're about to all be killed. 
good news is we don't have to go back to South Dakota, but I have to correct that. It's to go back to North Dakota, not <laughs> South Dakota. That's where they were based, Fort Lincoln. So uh, yeah, we don't want to be the butt of that joke. And, and I love North Dakota as well. Let me just make that clear. A lot of people up in North Dakota, uh, we met over 100 landowners working on that cross in the Plains book, as well as in the Black Hills. So uh, all, of, all of good friends and uh, interested in this. So yeah, well, Again, thank you all thank for you. coming, and uh, I'll be glad to chat afterwards. Thank you for tuning in online if you did that, and we'll uh, talk to you anytime. Any questions at all, shoot me an email on my website. I'm happy to, to correspond. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks again. Absolutely. Thank you. We just want to thank you all again for coming. He is signing books, and I'll be helping and enjoy. And thanks again. Thank <laughs> you.